All right, so today we're going to talk about relations and functions. Um, it's a concept that I think in its basic form makes a lot of sense, but as we start introducing um, function notation and whatnot, students tend to get a little tripped up. So <clears throat> we're going to need to make sure that we, we um, do a very good job of, of defining and, and um, learning some of the basics first. So by the time we're finished here, you should be able to determine whether the relation is a function, uh, know what a domain and range uh, is, what domain and range are, and, and how to find them, and then use the vertical line test to see if a relation is a function. <clears throat> there are standards that we're going to hit. Uh, some definitions first, and then we'll come back and talk in more detail about them, and I'll give them to you. A relation is any set of ordered pairs. Remember that an ordered pair is just what we use to plot points, so that x comma y, right? Um, and so this tells us that x <clears throat> is related to y in some shape, form, or fashion, okay? Now, if that relation assigns exactly one value in the range to each value of the domain, then it's a function. And we don't know what a range and, and domain are yet, so that's the definition of a function. It's a relation that assigns exactly one value in the range to each value of the domain. So what are domain and range? Domain is the collection of all input values, or x's, and we'll explain that in a little bit more detail in a second. The range is the collection of all output values, or y's. Okay? <clears throat> so what does all this stuff mean? All right, so we know that a relation takes one number, and very often there are numbers here, like 1 comma negative 3, right? So now we're going to relate 1 to negative 3 somehow. A function, and here's what a function is. So a function, or better yet, a relation is like a machine, right? We're going to take some numbers and put them into this machine. These are your inputs, right? And then the relation or the relationship is going to do something to this number and it's going to spit out another number as our output, <clears throat> okay? Now, it could be that we put a 1 in here and what pops out after our relation does some stuff to it is a negative 3. Okay? These inputs are also known as the domain. That's just definition. Okay? And domain is very often the x's in an ordered pair. Right? Remember that our relations um, are just ordered pairs, x's and y's. So these guys are our inputs. Our outputs are also known as the range. And the range is represented by y. And so these guys are our range. Okay? So if we put a 1 in to our relation and a relation spits out a negative 3, or if we put a 2 in and it spits out a 4, as long as when we put an input in that we get exactly one output from it, then this guy is a function. That's what this means. <clears throat> one range for each domain. One range, one negative three here is mapped to one. Now, if for some strange reason, when we put a one into this relation and it gives us a two, a three, and a four, say, then this is no longer a function. Because for one domain, we're getting three ranges. Another way to look at it is when I put a number into this relation, I should know exactly what I'm going to get coming out. I shouldn't have to guess. Is it going to be a 2? Is it going to be a 3? Is it going to be a 4? I should know exactly what it is. So if I put a 1 in, I have to get exactly one, one number coming back out in order for it to be a function. If that's not true, then it's not a function anymore. Okay still would be a relation, 
just not a function. <clears throat> okay? So let's try to tell if a relation is a function or not. Okay? And here's one way we can do that. We can list our inputs and our outputs. And we list it so that we know what input gets mapped to what output. So the question is, is this guy a function? So what this is telling us is that 1 is related to 3, 2 goes to 4, 3 goes to 5, and 4 goes to 6. So when I put a 1 into that relation, I get a 3 out. When I put a 2 into that relation, I get a 4 out. And every time I put an input in, I know exactly what I'm going to get out. So that means that this is a function. Yes, this is a function. Okay? The domain of this function is just a set of inputs. So your domain is 1, 2, 3, 4. Your range is just your set of outputs, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay? Now in your notes it asks you why this is a function. Why is this a function? Because you can say simply that each input goes to exactly one output. Okay, and we'll write this down again in a second. But this is a function. Number two, take a look. Does every input go to exactly one output? No one goes to three. 2 goes to 3, 3 goes to 4, 4 goes to 4. So each input goes to exactly one output. It's okay if some of those outputs are the same. This is still a function. Why? Because again, each input goes to exactly one output. Okay? Uh, our domain is our list of inputs, which is 1, 2, 3, 4. Our range is our list of outputs, different, our list of different outputs, which is just 3 and 4. You don't have to worry about writing down the 3 twice or the 4 twice. Just list the different values. Okay? Think you got it? Check out number 3. Is this going to be a function? Think about that for a second. Come up with an answer and a reason why or why not, and then write out your domain and range. So what do you think? The question is, when I put an input in, do I know exactly what I am get coming, get coming out? Here, apparently when I put a 1 in, I could get a 3 or a 4. So I don't know exactly what I get coming out. So this is not a function. And why? Because one input... goes to more than one output. Okay? Just for practice, domain and range. Domain is going to be one, two, and three. The range is three, four, five, and six. Again, we don't have to write down duplicates. Okay? So we can show a function like this, or a relation like this, not always a function. We can show a relation with an input and output table, or a t-chart. As a matter of fact, this is what you used when you first learned how to graph lines. You made a t-chart. Did you know that you were actually graphing a function? Okay, and you were. We could also show a relation using Venn diagrams. If we're going to do that, then we have to use arrows to show us what inputs go with what outputs. Okay? So a Venn diagram like this shows a relation. Is this relation a function? Well, as you see here, this 1 is getting mapped to both 2 and 3, and that can't happen. We, can't have, we have to know exactly what we get when we put an input in. So this is not a function. Why? Because one input goes to <clears throat> more than one output. Okay? 
domain. We can still do domain, and domain is going to be your 1, 3, 5. Your range is just going to be the other Venn diagram, 2, 3, 5, 8. So there are different ways to show a relation. All right, take a look at the next one. Fill in the numbers there. They're all 7. question is, is this a function? And I hope you're saying to yourself that yes, this is a function. Each input, just two, gets mapped to exactly one output, which is seven. So for your y, each input goes to exactly one output. I'm going to stop writing it um, just to save time. Domain, very simply, is two. And your range, very simply, is seven. Okay. How about this guy? <clears throat> what do you think about this guy? Stop the video and see what you come up with. Start it back up and see if you're right. Okay, what do you think? This is not a function. Why not? Because apparently when you put a 4 into this relation, you might get a 14 or a 16. And we can't have to guess. So there is an input that goes to more than one output, and we can't do that to be a function. Okay? Domain for practice, one, two, three, four. Range for practice, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. Okay? And just so we're aware, this is still a relation, so we can still write ordered pairs. One relates to eight. 2 relates to 10, 3 relates to 12, and we can do it for all of our functions as well. Okay, don't forget the domain or x's, the range or y's. Now, the last way we can show a relation is to actually use the ordered pairs. A little harder to see if it's a function or not. So I think what I'm going to suggest you do is to actually write an input-output table. So go 2 to 4, 3 to 4, 2 to 4, 3 to 4. I'll just use each ordered pair to create each line in the table. Okay? Is this a function? The answer is yes. Each input goes to exactly one output. It's the same one. So that's okay. So our domain is just 2 and 3. Our range is just 4. Okay? Try this with 8. Let's see what you come up with. Okay, what do you think? If you're in the habit of writing the table out, 1 goes to 7, 3 goes to 8, 5 goes to 9, 7 goes to 10. Absolutely no problem at all. Each input goes to exactly one output. This is a function. The domain is 1, 3, 5, 7. The range is 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay? How about 9? Take a look. Stop the video, start it back up, and see what, uh, what you come up with. How about this? This is definitely a function. Your domain is negative 5, negative 4, 3, negative, negative 3, negative 2. Your range is negative 1. Okay? All right. <clears throat> now, how do we know? Right? Back through any of these examples, how do we know? that two relate, how two uh, maps to seven, or I need another function here. How do we know that one went to three in this example, and two went to three, and three went to four? Well, we told you, that's how you knew, but what we can do is we can actually define a relation, or define a function. 
So in other words, when I put something into this machine, what's going to happen to my number to give me the number coming out? What's going to happen to my input? What's going to happen to my input to let me know what's going to come out? That's where this comes along. That's the definition of the function. So when I put a number in here, we're going to do 3x minus 7 to it, <coughs> and then get a number out. Okay? So how does that work? Well, we literally take the domain, which is also the x's, put it into the uh, definition of the function, and see what comes out. We can create an input-output table, or a t-chart, just like you did when you were graphing lines. This actually is a linear function, so it should look pretty familiar. So I'm going to put in negative 1, 1, and 3. Define the range values. We simply take negative 1 and plug it in for that x. So we get 3 times negative 1 minus 7. 3 times negative 1 is negative 10. Negative 10 minus 7 is negative 7. Sorry. <laughs> negative 3 times 1 is actually negative 3. Negative 3 times, or sorry, negative 3 minus 7 is negative 10. So negative 1 gets mapped to negative 10. If I put negative 1 into that machine, I'm going to get a negative 10 out. Same thing for the other two inputs. Literally put them into the equation. So we get 3 minus 7, or negative 4. And then we're going to put 3 in here. 9 minus 7 is 2. And so we can even write them as ordered pairs. Negative 1 common negative 10. 1 common negative 4. This would tell you where to put all of your dots in the coordinate plane. Okay, That's how we're going to be able to create a range from a given set of domains, x's and y's. <coughs> Okay. Now you try. The um, definition of this function is 1 half x minus 2. 1 half x minus 2. Sorry for that. See if you can't create the range. Okay. Start with your table. Our domain is negative 1, 0, 2. These are our x's. So we're going to put those in for x. When we do, we get 1 half times negative 1 minus 2. 1 half times negative 1 is just negative 1 half minus 2. Now, to subtract, to, to combine these two like terms, we've got to have these guys be common denominators, which has got to be a 2. So we get negative 1 half minus 4 over 2, which gives us negative 5 halves. So you can write negative 5 halves or negative two and a half. Okay? Zero. If we plug in zero, the uh, arithmetic gets a little bit easier. We get zero minus two, which is negative two. If we put in two, half of two is one, so we get negative one. And so there are our ordered pairs, negative one comma negative two and a half, 0 common negative 2 and 2 common negative 1. Okay? Now, 12. Try 12. Stop the video, work it out, and see what range values you get to go with these domain values. Did you get negative 3, 1, and 7 for your range? Okay, I showed the first one. But we're literally just going to plug these domains in for the x's. And notice how we're always plugging in for x. With these domain values, we're always plugging in for x. We've never plugged anything in for y. We didn't do anything for the, for the y. We just worked on the right-hand side, plugging in for x and doing the arithmetic, Okay, our order of operations. We're going to actually carry that forward in just a moment. Okay. Now, um, said before, right, what we're doing is we're creating ordered pairs that would allow us, sorry again, to plot these points and create a graphical display of a function. That's what we're going to talk about next. If we have a graphical display of a function, 
in, without domains and ranges listed, without the function being defined, <clears throat> we can still decide if that relation is a function. If we have a relation graphed, then we can still determine if that relation is a function. What we do is the vertical line test, and I'm going to tell you why in just a second. But the vertical line test is a method to determine if a relation is a function or not. If a vertical line passes through a graph more than once, the graph is not the graph of a function. Why? Why more than once? Well, here's what the graphical display means. This is a function. You can't see that. This is a function. That's, that's a graph. You know, instead of listing domain and range for a function, we do this. And this is still showing you a function. That line is a function. Sorry, it's a relation. I don't want to call it a function yet. It's a relation. It tells us how to relate an X to a Y, how to relate a domain to a range, how to relate an input to an output. All of those things mean the same thing. But that line does that. And remember that your X uh, axis is the horizontal axis and Y is the vertical axis. So what does a vertical line test do? If I draw a vertical line down through this graph, what I'm really representing is that domain of negative 2, right? Because right there is negative 2. The x is negative 2, or domain is negative 2, or input is negative 2. The graph, where this line hits the graph, tells me what range, or what y, or what output is related to that input. So if our input is negative 2, then the output that is um, related to it is negative 2. So apparently, when I put a negative 2 into the function, I get a negative 2 out, which is fine. I need to know exactly what I get out. Okay, if I draw another vertical line down through here, where it hits the graph is right here. That tells me that if I put a 2 into the function, then I want to get a 2 coming out. And I can only have one value coming out. So if the vertical line only hits the graph in one spot, then that means that there's exactly one output for every input. So that means that this guy is definitely a function. <clears throat> Same here. Every domain line, and call it that if you want to, or every input line hits the graph exactly in one spot, which means that we have exactly one output for every input line. So this is a function. Now what does it mean if it hits twice? Well here, if I draw a vertical line through negative 1, then my input is negative 1, and everywhere it hits the graph shows me an output that maps to negative 1. So it might be 3.1, right, you know, right there. Um, it hits it again to where negative 1 gets mapped to apparently 1.8. And then negative 1 gets mapped to, apparently, negative 0.8. That's too many outputs for one input. So this is going to be a no. And it's a no because that vertical line hit the graph in three spots. And it can't do it. It can only hit it in one spot. Okay, that's your vertical line test. Now, Function notation, okay? We've already seen a version of function notation, y equals 2x minus 3. That's basically function notation. That's a linear function. And remember that when we had our domain and we wanted to find the range, we kept plugging numbers in for x. Well, all we're going to do now is true function notation takes this y out and puts an f of x in its place. So instead of writing y equals, we would write f of x, and that's how you read that, f of x is equal to 2x minus 3. 
It's not f times x, it's read f of x. Okay, so when the domain, when the input is x, we find the range by taking 2x minus 3. Okay, so what does that mean as far as evaluating the function or trying to figure out what inputs and outputs get mapped together? Well, like I said before, this is just notation. There's nothing to do on the left-hand side of any of these function notations. Every, all the work is on the right-hand side. So when we show f of 3, that's what this is, f of 3, not f times 3, what that means is I'm going to take 3 and I'm going to put it into our machine and I'm going to try to figure out what comes out. The way I do that is I put the 3 in for, just like we did before, in for that x right there. So f of 3 would be equal to negative 3 times 3 plus 8. <clears throat> We're basically just putting 3 in for every x that we see. Now, like I said before, there's nothing to do on this left-hand side. That's not f times 3. That's just notation. It's just there to let us know that 3 is our input. The right-hand side will tell us our output. Negative 3 times 3 is negative 9. Negative 9 plus 8 is negative 1. So when we put 3 into the machine, we get negative 1 coming out. And so that helps us create our ordered pair here as well, where it would be 3 comma negative 1. We could go graph that ordered pair. This is just function notation. Okay? So what do you think for 17? Take a look at that. Same function, f of x is equal to negative 3x plus 8. We need to evaluate when x is negative 5, when the input is negative 5. Okay. Well, f of negative 5 would be equal to negative 3 times negative 5 plus 8. Negative 3 times negative 5 is 15. This is 23. So our ordered pair would be negative 5 comma 23. Our input would be negative 5. Our output would be 23. Okay, how about this, f of 0, okay, same thing, f of 0, if we simply put 0 in for x and do the arithmetic, 0 plus 8, which is 8. So what we've done is we've created some ordered pairs, 3 common negative 1, negative 5, comma 23 and then 0 comma 8 and all of those ordered pairs we could plot and graph and we'd graph a function it shows that our domain is 3 negative 5 0 and our range is negative 1 23 8 okay this function notation is where people tend to get a little tripped up because it looks a little weird and you're not used to seeing it like this okay all right try these find out what the value of g of negative 3 is. Stop the video, try to work it out, and see what you come up with. Okay. g of negative 3, negative 2 times negative 3, plus 9, minus, and then we got to put a negative 3 in for that x. So it means we need to introduce some parentheses. Negative 2 times negative 3 is 6. Negative times negative 3 becomes a positive 3. And so we get 18. So our ordered pair is negative 3, comma, 18. Okay, try this guy. Okay, g of a half. Negative 2 times 1 half plus 9 minus, and we're going to put in 1 half. Negative 2 times a half. Well, the easy way is a half of negative 2 is negative 1 plus 9 minus 1 half. Negative 1 plus 9 is 8 minus a half gives you 7 and a half. So now we've got an ordered pair of a half, comma, 7 and a half. 
it's that easy. We're just plugging in for x. Okay, last but not least, try this guy. Okay, did you get negative 12? You should have. So your order pair would be 7, comma, negative 12. All right, and that's it. Still a little fuzzy, still a little confusing. Make sure you come in and see me during STAR after school whenever you can. And we'll get it figured out, okay? Uh, homework's out in Canvas. Uh, make sure you have that done by next class.